So the first thing is, is what I'm suggesting and what I'm suggesting all of you do is actually stand up in your spaces and literally say, um, we need to have a revolution. We need to have a revolution. That's six words. In other words, what I'm suggesting we need to do is, is to make the word revolution a serious political proposition in the sense that it is in many parts of the world already, in the sense that it was before 1989 and in the sense that it's a sociological category, right? It happens every 30, 50, 70 years. Most countries over the last few hundred years have revolutionary events. It's nothing unusual. It's a realist proposition in other words. So in order to get it to that position where people can think about it as a real proposition, people need to be start using the word and they need to propose it as something which overcomes the two main ideas about what revolution is. So at the moment, particularly in the Western world, people tend to think a revolution is some idealistic nonsense of, you know, young people, you know, going through a phase, all that sort of stuff. And then paradoxically, they think the opposite, which is it's a nasty, violent, extremist, communist sort of plot type thing. Of course, it can be one of those two things, but it's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is the democratic revolution that's going to take control of the state and institute a constitution of citizens' assemblies and variations on the theme. In other words, you stand up and say, what we need to have is a revolution and that means we need to take over the state and have citizens' assemblies running society. Once you've said that, then 30, 50, 70% of people are going to go, actually, that's a really good idea because everyone is looking for something that's credible, which is going to change the whole system, okay? Because everything that just tweaks the system is becoming exponentially uncredible, right? Which is why there's so much depression in progressive circles, because people are holding on to the idea that they can just tweak things and, you know, NGOs, political parties and all that sort of thing. So that's the first, the first provocation. The second one is a revolution in 21st century is basically a revolution against the revolutions of the 20th century. In other words, we shouldn't be like thinking that this is just going to be a rehash of 1968 or 1917 or whatever. We're reconstructing something that's quite different, not totally different, but quite different because we have new cards in the pack. In a, a primary element of this, obviously, is that it's got to be non-violent. It's got to be sociable. It's got to be connective. Otherwise, we're just going to replicate you know, all the right-wing criticisms of revolution. The third provocation is it's a revolution against the revolution imposed on us by neoliberalism, right? So this is like swapping the narrative around. Most revolutions historically are conservative reactions against a revolution imposed by the ruling class on ordinary people. That's why ordinary people have uprisings, right? This is often misunderstood. It's like that's the that's sociologically, that's the usual routine, right? Because the ruling class, the elites of society engage in a suicidal, you know, act of stupidity, get involved in wars, ruin the economy, destroy the environment, and ordinary people are going, we want to conserve our society and our state and our culture, and they have a revolution against this. In other words, how we want to frame this is we're the conservatives. Right? We're the people that want to maintain sociability, decency, you know, everything that everyone thinks is common sense. And all that's being destroyed by this suicidal global elite that is going to destroy world civilization and all the rest of it. So this is like the challenge, the framing challenges, you might say, and those are three provocations about it. The next thing is about leadership. I think leadership was what I was supposed to be talking about. One of the things that I'm trying to persuade the radical space around the Western world to do, if that doesn't sound too grand, is that leadership has to come back into the frame, right? The whole horizontalist experiment since 1989 has been a total disaster, right? Which revolutions have worked in the neoliberal period in any substantive way? Hardly any, 
and most revolutions or uprisings have failed, primarily due to lack of organisation, lack of charismatic leadership. Now, we all know, of course, because, you know, many of us here come from an anarchist background and an anti, you know, hard left background of saying there's many dangers with leadership, but there's many dangers with lots of things. And the fact of the matter is, unless we have people to inspire people globally and nationally and regionally, people will not rise up. Leadership is an essential element in a time of crisis, right? If everything was just trundling along, like in 2005, that's fine. You can engage in, you know, the horizontalist fetish, you know, everyone just does their own thing and there's no coordination, all this sort of stuff. In 2023, if we don't have leadership, we're dead. That's what I'm saying, right? When people have the charisma to, to take leadership positions, they have to be encouraged to do so in the way that Gandhi did or Martin Luther King did within an ethical service orientated uh, definition of what leadership is. And I've talked about that in the episodes. What this concretely means is, is this is what I want all of you to do. Next time you're in your, you know, your meeting, you get up and you say, uh, I have a plan to engage with people around the world in a revolution. And here's the plan. In other words, a critical part of, of leadership is to make a decision for the group and propose that to the group, right? And this is what's missing all around the world, is people standing up and saying, here's a plan and let's do it. And well, obviously, there's deliberation around that, but it's that proactive approach as opposed to asking questions, right? Asking questions is, is getting us nowhere, right? What we need is answers to those questions and then go and do it. OK, I've got like three little orientations here <laughs> about what revolutions involve. So there's a few more provocations. Like in, in 1900, all the main revolutionaries of the 20th century were all like penniless, you know, nobodies, basically. I think in the first uh, Russian Marxist conference in 1905 or something like that in London, there was only 43 people turned up. And they all had arguments to, with each other. The point is, is in 1900, the whole left project around the world had got nowhere. And within 50 years, like half the world's population, probably more than half the world's population, had experienced revolutions. And what I'm saying is, is this is what's going to happen. Between 2020 and 2070, half, three quarters of the world's revolution is going to experience revolutionary events. And the people on this call and the people you know are going to have to run those revolutions. That's, that's what I'm saying. It's like 1905, 43 people in London, right? That's what this, this, uh, this meeting is about today, now. Um, I read a book in prison about revolutions. I'm not sure whether I've got these stats right, but they're sort of interesting. But during the 20th century, 25% of revolutionaries were killed, okay? 50% of revolutionaries were put in prison and 25% of revolutionaries ended up running their states. Um, I think those stats are really interesting because they completely changed the frame of, oh, we're just miserable, you know, helpless, powerless people, right? The fact of the matter is 25% of the people in this call are likely to get killed in the next 50 years through political violence. 50% of you are going to go to prison and 25% of you are going to be running political societies, right? Running states. Maybe, maybe not. But what I'm trying to do is provoke you into thinking the future is not going to be like the past, right? The future is not going to be like 1990 to 2015. It just is not. There's this thing called history and massive changes happen. The last provocation, another provocation is, I saw this on telly, uh, uh, on, on the internet last week, 80 people invaded Cuba, I think in whenever it was, 1950-something, right? 80 people, and within a year or so, they had a successful revolution in Cuba. Now, there's loads of problems with that revolution. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying whether it was good or bad or whatever. What I'm saying is, is a small number of people can transform their society in a matter of 12 months, you know, two years, whatever it is, through a combination of civil resistance and bringing people together using sociability dynamics that I talked about in my podcasts. All right, so there you are. <laughs>
one or two last points. I, I, if I'm going to do like new episodes, I'm probably going to be focusing on, on the psychological and spiritual aspects of being a revolutionary. And I sort of really don't like those two words, you know, spirit, particularly spiritual because it all gets framed in the wrong way. But what I'm trying to say and what I'm trying to communicate is the key revolutionaries around the world cannot have a sort of defeatist materialist orientation. They can't have a utilitarian orientation. In other words, the core of left defeatism, i.e. what we've had for 30 years, you know, oh, this won't work. Oh, that's a really big problem. Oh, there's loads of difficulties with that. Subtext being don't do anything, right? Is revolutionaries historically are not utilitarian, right? What they're into is virtue and they're into adventure. In other words, like, I'm not concerned about Roger Hallam, this person, Roger Hallam. What I'm concerned about is me here on this call with you. In other words, the here and now, the immediacy of the real world. And secondly, I'm not that concerned about the world. I'm not that concerned about saving the world in that sort of way. What I'm concerned about is acting on the stage of life, right? And there's various different ways of saying that. In other words, playing my part. In other words, like, life is an adventure. So I want to sort of almost finish by this, this, uh, this thing that Danton said when he was going to get execu executed. Some of you probably know this, right? He got executed by Robespierre, right? So it was a bit of a downer, to put it mildly. So he's on the way to getting executed or the night before, and he just got up and he said to people, look what we've created, right? Look what we've created. So he's, he was positive even though he was going to his death. And you see this from revolutionaries, you know, over the last 500 years. They're not concerned about whether they succeed or fail. What they're concerned about is playing their part and creating something and being dynamic and living their life. And that's it, right? That's it. In other words, they have a transcendence. And there's different ways of doing this and there's different cultural modes of communicating it. But this is like critical because at the moment everyone's encased in this materialist defeatist frame where, you know, as soon as things go wrong, they give up. Like, who gives a fuck if things go wrong? Like, just get up and do it again. That's, you know, that's what makes revolutions. That's what made those 80 people, you know, go to Cuba. Not a stupid idea. But they won because they weren't concerned about winning. They were concerned about actually getting on and being revolutionaries. And let's go for it because life's short and all that sort of thing. All right, so that's another major theme. Last theme is about praxis. You know, I'm sure many of you know what I've been going to be saying about this. Is this whole project of doing these, of doing these, uh, you know, these podcasts and these talks is not intellectual masturbation as I said to uh, Aaron Bastiani, I think that's what he's called, you know, on, uh, what was it? Um, Navara Media, right? You know, I had a bit of an argy-bargy with him. What, what, everything that we do has to root theory in practice, right? Everything that I'm going to say is rooted in the experience of practice. In other words, we go out, we try things, we make mistakes, and we theorise on the basis of that. We're rooted in the revolutionary struggle. We're not detached like bourgeois, like revolutionaries who go on podcasts and listen to videos and go, oh, that's wonderful. You know, well done, Roger. Fantastic talk. That's all bollocks, right? What I want you to do is to do a plan after you've got off this, this uh, uh, video and actually make a list of what you're going to do. What are you going to do next, next Wednesday? How are you going to have... 30 assemblies in California in the next, you know, four months. How are you going to build a civil disobedience like outfit in Spain? You see what I mean? And all those resources are there through the Humanity Project, which is um, what I'm involved with and with A22. And you can get in touch with those people and they're going to tell you what to do. And then you're going to do it better and you're going to tell them what to do, right? So you've got this global praxis and some people are going to have better ideas than me. And that's great because we're all working together. And failure is going to be what drives us forward because failure is what tells us what's going wrong so we can improve. So this is a really big change, OK? So this is, you know, another, another variation on left defeatism, which is, 
oh you know the world's terrible there's nothing we can do all we can do is you know go on the internet go on YouTube and watch videos about the why the world's terrible and feel good about it that's you know that's a luxury of the last 30 years the next 30 years are you actually get organized you get on with shit otherwise we're going to die that's where we are in 2023